Yeah. Whoa, that's a big podium. Whoa. No, this is really <laughs> okay, we have votes on the floor, and uh, we're going to be voting uh, any minute now. So thank you very much for the opportunity to come and, and, uh, and say a few words to you about our great ally, our wonderful partner, Taiwan. Taiwan is a vibrant democracy. It is an ally. It is a friend of the United States. And our partnership, I'm so sorry about that, moved over here because he knows I'm short. And our partnership is based on shared values, on peace and prosperity. Taiwan is an inspiration for the world's oppressed. It is a model for future democratic transitions. And I say that as a Cuban refugee who came to Cuba, from Cuba to the United States when I was eight years old, fleeing communist aggression. So we see Taiwan as that model for a democratic transition, uh, including the Cuban people, and a beacon of freedom in the Pacific. The Taiwan Relations Act is the cornerstone of U.S.-Taiwan relations forming the foundation and guidelines for U.S. policy and commitment to the people of Taiwan, and we are proud to celebrate its 35th anniversary today, April 10th. However, we must admit that in many ways, the United States is not fulfilling the promise of the Taiwan Relations Act, and that we are not supporting Taiwan to the best of our ability. We're not supporting its democracy. We're not supporting the human rights of its people as strongly as we should and as strongly as we must. We must also be honest about the challenges that Taiwan is facing today. China's continued economic rise and Taiwan's increasing reliance on them as a trading partner, making up at least 40% of its total trade well, that threatens Taiwan's economic and political flexibility. Also, the current protests in Taiwan are about this lack of flexibility. They are about the fear that the service trade agreements with the agreement with the China, part of the larger Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement, or ECFA, will serve only to increase Chinese control over Taiwan. Now, in 2010, I warned that China was moving to fill the trade void left by the lack of American attention in the Pacific, and that ECFA may prove to be a Trojan horse or political tool masquerading as a trade instrument to achieve China's ultimate goal of absorbing Taiwan. Without greater economic flexibility, like that which would be achieved by a U.S.-Taiwan free trade agreement, China will have even greater economic leverage over Taiwan, will have even greater political leverage, will have even greater strategic leverage over Taiwan. China's aggression toward Taiwan and the, and the uh, surrounding islands, its implementation of an air defense identification zone, another double-digit increase in their military spending why are they ramping up their military in such a great force? Construction of a second aircraft carrier? All of these are clear indications of China's regional ambitions. Also, the U.S. appeasement of China. It hurts me as an American to see this happening. In addition to missile launches by the North Koreans and the feeble response, sadly, of the Obama administration to these violations of international sanctions, all of these actions call into question our U.S. resolve. Taiwan is saying, where is the U.S.? And all of our allies in the West Pacific region are asking, what is going on? There's much more that we can and must do to assist our great ally from uh, uh, Taiwan, from uh, bolstering Taiwan's economic independence by increasing uh, trade ties, by supporting Taiwan's participation in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, to providing essential defense materials, all of those we must do. It is time that the United States recommits to the Taiwanese people, and that is why I am so proud to have introduced, along with my colleagues, the chairs of the Congressional Taiwan Caucus, the Taiwan Policy Act. The Taiwan Policy Act will codify 
that it is U.S. policy, official U.S. policy, to support Taiwan, to support its democracy, to support the human rights of the Taiwanese people. It will reaffirm the continuation of longstanding policies established within the Taiwan Relations Act and by the Six Assurances of 1982. This bill will also strengthen our allies' ability to defend itself against Chinese aggression. How? By advancing the sale or transfer of necessary defense articles like the F-16CD fighter aircraft, Perry-class guided missile frigates, as well as other air and uh, air defense, maritime, ground capabilities. It will also help Taiwan build its capacity to partner with other friendly foreign nations and militaries in matters of intelligence, of communications, and training. It will further economic ties with Taiwan. It is our 10th largest trading partner by promoting bilateral trade agreements, investments, and with the ultimate goal of a free trade agreement. And it will also encourage visits by cabinet level and other high level officials and support meaningful participation in international organizations like the World Health Assembly and other UN entities. So because of all of the threats of Taiwan and around her neighborhood, combined with an inattention to Taiwan and a lack of strategic vision uh, by, in Asia by the Obama administration, relations between the United States and Taiwan are at a critical juncture it is unacceptable that the administration continues to delay, disassemble, and appease China when it comes to fulfilling its obligations to Taiwan, whether in the Taiwan Relations Act or its failure to reassess and update policies to respond to new developments in the region. As the TRA declares, Taiwan's future should be determined by peaceful means and China's rise in military and economic strength illustrates why the U.S. should and must help Taiwan's ability to resist any type of Chinese coercion. Modernizing Taiwan's air and sea capabilities are key efforts in giving Taiwan the ability to deter the Chinese threat, yet the administration has spent 13 years administration after administration reviewing submarine sales that were tentatively agreed on in 2001. Now that the U.S. Air Force is not funding the Combat Avionics Program Extension Suites, CAPES, Taiwan's F-16s upgrades are now in question, and not to mention the sale of new F-16 CDs, which my bill will rectify. And lastly, Taiwan's economic independence is a key component in deterring soft Chinese coercion. Yet this administration refuses to commit to help Taiwan join the TPP or move toward a bilateral investment agreement with the U.S. that would go a long way toward giving Taiwan that independence that it sorely needs. By passing the Taiwan Policy Act, the U.S. can signal our continued commitment to the Taiwanese people. It will show regional allies that we have not lost our resolve, we have not lost our determination to counterbalance Chinese power in the West Pacific. I am committed to making sure that the U.S. not only follows through on its past promises to the Taiwanese people, but also strengthens our relations in the years to come. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It is a delight to have been with you, and I'm so sorry that we've got so much going on today in the House. Thank you, my Thank you. Thank you. Come on over here and let's take a photo. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am pleased and honored. Thank you very much. Thank you. You are very nice. We've got, we've got one more over here. Thank you. So let's keep working together. We can get this done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Former Chairman Ross Layton, we're a bit longer than uh, expected, so we're going to cut the program a little bit. The, uh, I'd like to introduce you to the president of our organization, the Formosan Association for Public Affairs, Dr. Mark Kao. 
We promote freedom, human rights, democracy for the people of Taiwan, and uh, we are going to start with our program. We have Mr. Joe Bosco, and then we have two students from the uh, Sunflower Student Movement who will say a few words also. So, Mark. Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, today, as you know, is the 35th uh, anniversary of Taiwan Relation Act. And I'm glad, I'm happy to, I'm honored to uh, have our speaker, um, Mr. Uh, Joe Rosco, uh, to give us a um, talk about the TRA uh, 35th Towards Strategic Clarity. So, um, Joe is a good friend of Taiwan. Uh, he served in the office of the Secretary of Defense for many years and also taught at Georgetown University School of Foreign Services. And ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Joe to give us a talk. Is this okay for everybody, for the press? Will this work? Tim? Yeah. This will work, okay. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much for that introduction and for the invitation. And uh, after the talk by the chairwoman, I'm not sure that I can add anything to the level of enthusiasm that she imparted uh, on the issue of the uh, microphone. Okay. This thing is not leveled, so it's going to have to put a glass of water here. Uh, the Taiwan Relations Act has appropriately been called one of the most important pieces of uh, legislation ever enacted by Congress. Uh, not only did it pass uh, by overwhelming near unanimous bipartisan majorities, but it was done in direct defiance of an executive action by the President in a sensitive foreign policy area affecting relations with two critical Asian nations. Similarly, in recent days, as the Chairwoman said, uh, new concerns about the direction of U.S. policy toward uh, China and Taiwan motivated the Congress and the House of Representatives, uh, this time unanimously, uh, passed a resolution reaffirming the TRA commitment to Taiwan and authorizing the sale of additional military assets. Though it does not yet have the same force of law as the TRA, it confirms the continuing strong emotional and strategic ties the American people as a whole feel toward Taiwan. The entire history of U.S.-Taiwan relations demonstrates that it has never been a partisan issue. It has never pitted Republicans against Democrats, as so many other issues do. Instead, uh, U.S.-Taiwan policy has reflected two sets of related divisions within American society and foreign policy thinking. The first is an institutional divergence within the U.S. government between the executive branch and the congressional. That transverses Republican and Democratic administrations. The second is a philosophical dichotomy in foreign policy between, on the one hand, self-styled realists focused on what they see as U.S. national interests, and on the other, those who favor a more idealistic approach based on America's uh, commitment to democratic and universal human rights values. Again, there are Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives in both camps. To the extent the two sets of divisions converge, it can generally be said that the Congress, which establishes the framework for U.S. policy and is also closer to the American people, tends to reflect the humanistic, democratic American impulse. The executive branch, on the other hand, which must implement the nation's policy, usually takes the so-called realist approach, which generally resists intervention and favors managing relations through diplomacy rather than overt action. Of course, there have been exceptions in both Democratic and Republican administrations, for example, Vietnam and Iraq, where the executive itself espoused a moral cause for intervention. Overall, however, the generalization does apply to America's China-Taiwan <coughs> policy. Executive branch officials tend to downplay the human rights concerns with China except in their annual reports and their pro forma statements at various bilateral meetings. But human rights do not interrupt business as usual with China. As former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton famously said on her first official visit to China, Washington raises human rights, Tibet and Taiwan with China, quote, 
but our pressing on those issues cannot interfere with the global economic crisis, the global climate change crisis, and the security crisis." Unquote. Wei Jin Sheng, former Chinese political prisoner, criticized that approach with an interesting statement on the effect it would have in China. He said, when the U.S. government panders, they beat us more. When the U.S. government talks tough, they beat us less. To be fair, however, no administration is monolithic, as Vice President Joe Biden demonstrated when he visited Beijing in December. Upon his arrival at the U.S. Embassy, the irrepressible Biden spotted a line of Chinese visa applicants and pounced on his captive audience. Expounding on the societal benefits of Western freedom of thought and expression, he told them, quote, innovation can only occur where you can breathe free. Then seeming, seeming to move beyond the economic realm to the political, Biden urged his Chinese listeners to follow the West's model, quote, children in America are rewarded, not punished, for challenging the status quo. The only way you make something totally new is to break the mold of what was old, unquote. Since Mao's communist re revolution had already succeeded in breaking up much of China's ancient civilization, the leaders in Beijing must not have been amused at the second highest U.S. official's blunt call for what would amount to a new Chinese revolution. Of course, Biden may have been reprising his role as a former senator and head of the Foreign Relations Committee, where he had the luxury of waxing eloquent on the moral aspects of foreign policy. Generally, administration officials go out of their way not to say things that would offend Chinese leaders. Congress, on the other hand, was not concerned with China's official sensitivities when it passed the TRA, which the Chinese government most definitely does not like. The document is simple, straightforward, and readily understood. Its purpose was to maintain peace, security, and stability in the Western Pacific and to promote the foreign policy of the United States. It declares that Taiwan's security is, quote, in the political, security, and economic interests of the United States. It states that, quote, diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China rest upon the expectation that the future of Taiwan will be determined by peaceful means. It says that, quote, any effort to determine the future of Taiwan by other than peaceful means, including by boycotts or embargoes, would be a threat to the peace and security of the Western Pacific area and of grave concern to the United States. It commits the United States, quote, to provide Taiwan with arms of defensive character and to maintain the capacity of the United States to resist any force, any resort to force or other forms of coercion that would jeopardize the security or the social or economic system of the people on Taiwan. Let's have the Congressman. I already I'll warned come back our to speaker, this looks more impolite than it actually is, because I already warned that if the right. member of Congress walks in, and we're very honored to have the uh, chairman of the uh, Asian Pacific Affairs Subcommittee, Congressman Steve Shevin. Thank you. I apologize for interrupting uh, the speaker, and I will assure you I will not make this interruption uh, long. I want to thank you all for being here and being friends of Taiwan. Um, I want to thank uh, Kum Blau for his uh, spirited uh, advocacy of all things good for Taiwan for so many years now. We've worked so closely together on a whole range of issues, and so many of my other friends that I see here today as well. Um, I was one of the four founders of the Congressional Taiwan Caucus many years ago, and I, as was mentioned, I'm now the chair of the Asian Pacific uh, Subcommittee in, in Foreign Affairs. Just got back from uh, Taiwan about three or four weeks ago. Um, and the, we're of course celebrating, commemorating the uh, 35th uh, anniversary of the uh, Taiwan Relations Act, which along with uh, President Ronald Reagan's uh, six assurances has been a cornerstone of our policy for many, many years now. And Taiwan, of course, uh, is a thriving democracy um, and uh, I believe could be a role model to many other countries around the world, as well as the PRC. Um, and I certainly believe uh, to my core that the future of Taiwan should be determined by the people of Taiwan, not by the PRC, not by the United States or anyone else. It should be determined by the people. And 
And I know when I uh, first came to Congress uh, about 20 years ago, there were a couple of hundred missiles pointed at Taiwan from the PRC, and that grew steadily till we're approximately 1,600 missiles. Um, and so it's so important that Taiwan continue to strengthen uh, its military, whether it's submarines or whether it's a missile defense system or whether uh, it is uh, uh, fighter aircraft. Uh, all those things are, are instrumental, and the United States continues to, needs to continue to work with Taiwan to make these these and many other things uh, happen so that the future will be determined by the people of Taiwan and not anyone else. So I want to thank you all for being here. I apologize again for disrupting the speaker. There may well be other members of Congress uh, stopping by, uh, uh, but I unfortunately have to uh, to, to catch a plane and uh, head back to the, uh, uh, the, the not the second great, greatest city on earth, which is Taipei, but the greatest city, Cincinnati, Ohio. So thank you very much. Okay. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. So the TRA has this language that I, that I do want to call to your attention. <clears throat> it says the United States will provide Taiwan with arms of a defensive character and to maintain the capacity of the United States to resist any resort to force or other forms of coercion that would jeopardize the security of the social or economic system of the people on Taiwan. Remember those words, maintain the capacity of the United States to defend Taiwan. We'll come back to that in a minute. There's widespread agreement that over the past 35 years, the act has helped protect Taiwan security and enabled it to pursue the, dem the has helped protect Taiwan security and enabled it to pursue the democratic path that was led by Taiwan's brave political opposition and finally agreed to by Chiang Ching-kuo, the son and Guomindang successor of Chiang Kai-shek. Taiwan has become a vibrant democratic model for the world and a living repudiation of those in China and the West who argue that a non-Western tradition or a Confucian influence is inherently incompatible with democracy. The question rarely asked, if ever, is this. What would Taiwan's situation and the situation in the region have been had the TRA not been enacted? The question is important because the TRA, while a binding act of Congress, still allows some flexibility in the way the executive branch interprets and carries out the congressional intent, as the Congresswoman mentioned. In the, in the language I just quoted, the TRA does not explicitly commit the U.S. to defend Taiwan only to, quote, maintain the capacity to do so. What then did the Carter administration envision for, the, for Taiwan's future until the Congress intervened with the TRA and disrupted those plans and expectations? The answer is that President Carter and his national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, had adopted the very same real politique approach established by President Nixon and his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger. Thus again, Democratic and Republican administrations pursued the same policy vis-a-vis -vis China. As Kissinger has proudly noted, <coughs> excuse me, every one of the eight administrations since then has followed the same one China policy set forth in the Shanghai communique, a document that I believe can fairly be called the original sin of US-China policy. Today, given the current state of China-U.S. relations more than four decades later, it is worth reviewing what the hopes and expectations of the parties were at the time of the opening and how they have been realized or disappointed by actual developments in the relationship over the years. The best sources are the writings and public statements of Nixon and Kissinger. Nixon himself called his China initiative a, quote, strategic gamble. But the tensions between China and the Soviet Union at that time had created an opportunity for U.S. diplomacy, and he and Kissinger seized it. We can start by asking, what did China want from the new relationship, and what did it get? 
First, writes Kissinger, Beijing wanted assurance that the U.S. would not join with the Soviets in an anti-China condominium. Beijing got not only that, but also explicit American protection against the Soviet attack, an unprecedented, unprecedented commitment to a former but still unreconciled enemy. Next, China wanted U.S. diplomatic recognition, and it won a clear commitment that Washington was now on that path. Nixon planned to do it in his second term until Watergate intervened and left the unfinished business to Jimmy Carter. China wanted the U.S. Seventh Fleet out of the Taiwan Strait and the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Taiwan. It got the first immediately and the latter on a protracted schedule. It wanted U.S. recognition of Beijing's claim of sovereignty over Taiwan. It got the Shanghai communique in which Kissinger finessed the status question by using what he called his, quote, ambiguous formula. Nixon called it brilliant, and Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai liked it too. The Taiwanese and Chinese populations on Taiwan were not consulted. Finally, China wanted economic aid and access to Western technology. It got both in abundance. And China won all those concessions even before Kissinger and Nixon actually went to China. This in itself violated their renowned realist principles. Nixon had told Kissinger, we should avoid looking too eager to reach an agreement by promising to do this and that for China. And Kissinger has often instructed that making concessions in advance of negotiations guarantees that they will not be reciprocated. But he was well aware that China had the upper hand in the negotiations. As he put it later, quote, all the Chinese have to do is lift a finger and the U.S. comes running. So the next question is, what did Washington want from the opening to China? First, as Kissinger told Nixon in June 1969, quote, to play off the Chinese communists against the Soviets, to extract Soviet concessions or influence, influence their actions. This was the so-called China card. It did produce a brief period of U.S.-Soviet detente. But that was soon followed by one of the most dangerous phases of the Cold War, as the Soviets moved aggressively in several of the world's trouble spots during the 1970s. And even the detente period ultimately worked to China's advantage. A series of strategic arms treaties reduced Russian and U.S. nuclear stockpiles, while China continued to build up its own strategic arsenal, as it is still doing today. Next, Washington wanted help, uh, wanted Beijing's help in ending the war in Vietnam on honorable terms for America. In Kissinger's words, quote, we made the withdrawal of our military forces from Taiwan conditional on the settlement of the Vietnam War, unquote. Instead, Beijing pocketed the Taiwan concessions but continued its material, political, and diplomatic support for Hanoi's conquest of the South culminating in North Vietnam's full-scale invasion in 1973. The Paris Peace Treaty, which won Kissinger the Nobel Prize, was shredded. Kissinger acknowledges that he expected the North Vietnamese to violate the agreement, but he apparently thought China would restrain them. Parenthetically, that was a mistake Kissinger and others have repeated regarding China's support for North Korea, which we can discuss during the Q&A, if you like. Mark, is there anyone who needs to, Mark, is there anyone who needs to take the floor? No. Okay. The Shanghai communique also stated Washington's, quote, interest in a peaceful settlement of the Taiwan question, but it did not commit the U.S. to oppose the use of force, Kissinger's ambiguity again, and China made no pledge to renounce it. On the contrary, Mao and Zhou Enlai explicitly affirmed China's intention to use force against Taiwan. Kissinger says Mao repeatedly told him that China would eventually attack Taiwan, whether it would be in five, ten, or a hundred years, he couldn't say. Kissinger told Mao he was surprised the Chinese would wait that long. Kissinger's writings clearly suggest a tacit understanding that after a decent interval, Washington would acquiesce in China's military takeover of Taiwan. The U.S. one-China policy, which is supposedly agnostic on the future of Taiwan, 
but Beijing has relentlessly distorted the American position to coincide with its own One China principle, which unequivocally states that Taiwan is part of China, period. Over time, American scholars and policymakers have grown weary of the intellectual and theological distinctions between the One China policy and the One China principle, and have often blurred the two formulations, which has worked to China's advantage. Kissinger states the majority view that one way or the other, sooner or later, Taiwan will in fact be incorporated into the People's Republic. He said in an Asia Society interview in 2007 that Taipei needs to come to terms with Beijing because, quote, China will not wait forever. Meanwhile, the U.S. policy of so-called strategic ambiguity regarding the defense of Taiwan has done nothing to deter or dissuade China from preparing to take it by force, as Mao promised. <coughs> but if Kissinger's view of Taiwan's future has not changed over the decades, as the island country progressed economically and politically, Nixon's post position did evolve. He wrote in 1994, even before Taiwan's democracy was fully realized, quote, the situation has changed dramatically since the Shanghai communique. Realistic reappraisals of U.S. relations with Taiwan and between Beijing and Taipei are overdue. The separation is permanent politically, but they are in bed together economically, unquote. Nixon urged U.S. policymakers at that time to strongly support Taiwan's membership in international economic organizations and, quote, to extend to Taiwan's government officials the diplomatic courtesies that the leaders of one of the world's major economic powers deserve. He also stated, quote, the Chinese will not launch a military attack against Taiwan as long as Beijing knows such an action would jeopardize their relationship with the United States, unquote. We can all hope that Nixon was right about that, but hope is not a policy. Since he wrote those words, we have had these events. The Taiwan Strait crisis of 1995-96, with China launching missiles toward Taiwan and promising a sea of fire if U.S. carriers enter the strait. What other uh, communist regime uses that lovely phrase? We had a Chinese general threatening to destroy Los Angeles if the U.S. intervened to protect Taiwan. And we got a statement of official U.S. policy saying that if China did attack Taiwan, the United States might or might not defend it. Quote, it would depend on the circumstances of the Chinese attack. We have also experienced the EP-3 incident where a Chinese military jet collided with an unarmed U.S. reconnaissance plane and yet another Chinese general threatening nuclear attacks, this time against hundreds of American cities if we dared to defend Taiwan. Finally, we've had a massive Chinese military buildup, including anti-access and area denial weapons, <clears throat> such as attack submarines and the world's first anti-ship ballistic missiles, all intended to deter or defeat any U.S. intervention in a cross-strait conflict. Think of it. A single torpedo or missile striking a U.S. carrier could kill more Americans in minutes than were lost on December 7 and September 11 combined. Imagine the U.S. response to such a calamitous event and ask why China is even contemplating it. But the overriding purpose of the Nixon-Kissinger overture to China, followed by Carter and Brzezinski, apart from satisfying the four men's lofty ambitions, was to integrate China into the international community and to change its worldview, starting with what Kissinger called, quote, the heretofore hated United States. There was also the implicit hope that joining the world community would eventually soften China's approach to governance and the way it treated its own people. But the main focus clearly was to moderate China's approach to international relations. In a 1972 speech, Kissinger predicted that when the history of that period is written, it will celebrate, quote, the opening of an era of foreign affairs in which the United States established a more stable international order, unquote. Nixon said later that the China opening flowed from his early belief that, quote, we simply cannot afford to leave China forever outside the family of nations. 
there to nurture its fantasies, cherish its hates, and threaten its neighbors. As president, he said his objective was, quote, to draw China into a constructive relationship with the world community. You stop to think of 800 million people, where they're going to be. This is a hell of a move. Looking back in 1994, he said, quote, our rapprochement opened the door for China to the world community, and it opened the eyes of the Chinese to the world, unquote. But in today's world, after 40 years of Western trade and investment, we still have a Chinese government which, in Nixon's words, nurtures its fantasies, cherishes its hates, and threatens its neighbors. To compensate for their own lack of political legitimacy, Chinese military and political leaders stir aggressive nationalism by constantly reminding their people of the century of humiliation at the hands of the West. Beyond preparing for war over Taiwan, China has begun throwing its military weight around elsewhere, including U.S. naval and air assets and those of other nations in the South China Sea, reminding those countries that, quote, China is big and you are small, and threatening war with Japan over the Senkaku Daiutai Islands. At a recent CSIS conference, countries from the region, region changed their description of Chinese behavior from assertive to aggressive. China has also supported reckless North Korean actions on the Korean Peninsula in the Yellow Sea and elsewhere. Years later, when Nixon looked back and saw a few signs of moderation in China's visceral resentment and hostility toward the West, he told the New York Times columnist, quote, we may have created a Frankenstein. We can only hope that this time Nixon was wrong, but the evidence is not encouraging. A year ago, James Clapper, Director of National Intelligence, told the Senate Intelligence Committee that, quote, China poses the greatest mortal threat to the United States. If this is what the real politique has brought us, the question is, who are the true realists? Based on that record, the opening to China and the way it has been carried out by subsequent administrations could fairly be described as one of the greatest strategic miscalculations in American diplomatic history. Today we have a new set of Chinese leaders headed, headed by Xi Jinping. Because he was a fresh face and because there was so much Western disappointment in the government of Hu Jintao and Wen Jiaobao, there were high hopes that she would initiate further economic change and finally start serious political reform. It is too early to predict whether he will fulfill those hopes, but in the area of international relations, he has already raised serious concerns. Immediately after assuming his positions as head of the Communist Party and the Chinese military, she made a series of visits to state-of-the-art military units and installations. He rallied his officers and men to be ready for, quote, real combat and, quote, fighting and winning wars, suggesting a sense of a not-too-distant conflict. She has adopted as his governing theme, The China Dream, the title of a popular book by a military intellectual at the National Defense University who advocates China's military dominance not just regionally, but globally. Xi's speeches equate a strong nation with a strong military. Economic development used to be the principal component in China's vision of comprehensive national power. Now, military power seems to be their dominant strategic emphasis. Chinese officials, their media and academic allies, and some Western scholars describe Beijing's militant posture as a natural Chinese response to a perceived American containment policy. But the reverse is true. China's dramatic military buildup and increasing assertiveness are what initially led to the U.S. pivot or rebalancing to Asia in the last two years of the Bush administration where I served. As Beijing continued its aggressive posture, the Obama team accelerated and explicitly announced the policy shift. In, February, in February's official journal of the Communist Party Central Committee, an article from the People's Liberation Army General Staff stated, quote, what determines the political and economic pattern of the world ultimately depends on force, unquote. That statement takes Mao Zedong's approach to domestic governance and extends it to international relations, 
political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. What we are seeing is the militarization of China's so-called peaceful rise and the end of Deng Xiaoping's approach, hide your capabilities and bide your time. Whether Xi Jinping is leading or acquiescing to PLA dominance of Chinese external relations, the result is the same. The China dream, as envisioned by Mr. Xi and the PLA, may become the world's nightmare. In closing, let me put the question, this question. With all its economic success and with no nation posing a military threat to China, indeed with the whole world competing to be on friendly and profitable relations with this economic powerhouse, why are Chinese leaders acting in such a manner? What are they afraid of? I submit that they do not fear an attack from any external threat from the U.S. or anyone else. What they fear is the Chinese people themselves. The Communist Party lacks the political legitimacy that comes with the popular consent of the governed, such as in Japan, South Korea, or Taiwan. Therefore, like other insecure dictatorships in the past, they must stir up the fires of nationalism against memories of outside aggression and exploitation. In 1978, Deng Xiaoping said in a speech to the party <clears throat> that China must fundamentally reform if it is to succeed and prosper. He said democracy and the rule of law must be institutionalized in China so that individual leaders could not change their minds and take away the people's rights. Deng's words and his actions in opening the economic system and lifting millions out of poverty inspired a whole ge generation of Chinese of all ages, but especially the young people. Throughout the 1980s, they enthusiastically supported Deng's ideas and urged other Chinese leaders to follow, to follow his example and implement political reform along with the economic opening. <clears throat> but in the end, <clears throat> with millions of people gathered in Beijing and other cities, and virtually the whole nation rallying behind him, Deng himself sadly lost his nerve, and a unique opportunity was lost for generations of Chinese. The massacre carried out by China's communist dictatorship in 1989 <clears throat> can be compared to the acts of violence perpetrated by Taiwan's anti-communist dictatorship in 1947. But both contrast sharply with the peaceful resolution of the recent protests in Taipei under Taiwan's democratic system. That alone provides all the reason the Taiwanese people need to reject ever unifying with the People's Republic of China and why the Taiwan Relations Act is so essential to protecting, protecting the support of Taiwan's democracy against the threat from China. It is critical, therefore, that Washington and Taipei get their respective and collective acts together to deter China's fallback position to use force. Taiwan needs to increase defense spending to at least the 3% level it has promised but not delivered for years. As for the United States, there are two important but simple actions Washington can take, one in the executive branch, the other in the Congress. To ensure that China does not make a disastrous strategic mistake by using force against Taiwan, they both involve eliminating any ambiguity regarding America's commitment to Taiwan. The President needs to restate President Bush's pledge in 2001 that the U.S. will do, quote, whatever it takes to defend Taiwan. For its part, Congress should amend the Taiwan Relations Act by inserting only three words so that the language we looked at earlier would read as follows to maintain the capacity and the commitment of the United States to resist any resort to force or other forms of coercion that would jeopardize the security or the social or economic system of the people on Taiwan. Those three words will speak volumes to Beijing <clears throat> and to the people of Taiwan. I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you for your attention. What I would like to do, um, <coughs> thank you all for being here, but uh, I'd like to, before we do the Q&A, I'd like to combine the Professor Kerry Jones. Sure. So um, we have a very special uh, addition to our program today, and that is, as you probably know, that since March 18, students in Taiwan have peacefully protested against the government's 
revving through of a great agreement legislation. And students, you know, the rally was held last week, 500,000 people in Taipei. And we're uh, on the right. Sorry. To, to have uh, two key leaders, representative leaders of the student movement here with us. And I would like a warm welcome for Wei Yang, and he's going to say a few words. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm Wei Yang. Okay. I'm Wei Yang. I'm here on behalf of the Sunflower Movement. We occupy Taiwan's Legislature Yuan, which is our parliament, for 23 days, from March 18th to April 10th. In the midst of your kind press for Taiwan's thriving democracy, I have brought here with me a statement that sheds light on another side of Taiwan's story. Taiwan is now known as a democracy, but the road to freedom was not easy. Since early 1920s, the Taiwanese people have been struggling for modern freedom, democracy, and we, we were occupied by the losing side of China's civil war. And for 38 years, from 1949 through 1987, we live under martial law. It was not until the early 1990s that we made our transition to democracy. But in the past few years, there has been a regression of the hard-won democracy. In particular, since last summer, there have been more and more issues where the Kuomintang government was, was increasingly unresponsive to the concern from the citizenry. There, there was the death of a conscript in the, in, in the military that brought 250,000 people out in August. There was the nuclear power issue where the government simply didn't listen to, uh, to, the, to our concern. And in September 2013, there was even a constitutional crisis when President Ma tried to oust the Speaker of the Legislature Yuan. This lack of good governance and this dysfunctional democracy finally led to an eruption of anger when March 17th, the controversial cross-service -tra trade agreement was sent to the Legislative Yuan's plenary session without a single minute's de de deliberation. This cross-service -tra trade agreement will have major consequences for Taiwan's economy, and in particular, affect labor and small and medium business, which will be overwhelmed by big Chinese companies. The agreement will not only expand China's influence, economic influence in Taiwan, but will also tighten China's grip on our political freedoms, just like they did in Tibet and Hong Kong. A third reason why we strongly oppose the service trade agreement is the lack of transparency and the lack of adequate democratic procedure in the legislature. The agreement was signed between Taiwan and the Chinese uh, delegate in June uh, 2013 in Shanghai without having any prior public deliberation, comprehensive impact assessment, or any notification to the legislative branch or Taiwanese public. We are not against a trade deal with China, but we are against a trade negotiation process that excludes deliberation and transparency, especially with a country like China, where the, consequence of, the consequences of such deal is much more than just economic effect, but also social and political changes. It was through effort of civil organizations that President Ma ying administration finally agreed last summer to have the agreement review item by item by legislative Yuan. However, on March 17th, that item by item review process agreement was broken. This angered the people. That is why on the night of March 18th, 
we led a group of 300 students to enter the legislative building to protest such failure in legislative integrity, as well as the steamrolling by the executive branch. From then on, we've occupied the legislative building inside and outside for 23 some days. Our, our demand was simple. Reject the agreement, establish a monitoring process to review all agreement signed between Taiwan and China. And then cross-strait service trade agreement can be reviewed under the new review law. Indeed, we feel that the government violate our, our right, our human rights, when in the night of March 23rd and 24th, riot, tro riot, riot troops and water cannon trucks were sent to evict peace peaceful protesters who had sat down on the ground of the executive yuan. More than 100 people were injured, including the TSU legislator, Mrs. Zhou, who was beaten so severely by the police that she had to be hospitalized. This is not democracy. This is a police state. There are those who condemn us for breaking the law, but we believe that we are upholding the real spirit of democracy. We are upholding the, the principles of check and balance between the legislative and the executive branches. And we insist that the public needs to, an, needs to be an integral part of the public deliberation of Taiwan and China-related policies. China is unlike any other country Taiwan conduct trade talk with. China was and still is insisting that it has sovereignty over Taiwan and that we need to be unified. We do not want that. We do want to retain our freedom, liberty, and the way of life. We stand strong, and we have a deep faith and conviction in democracy and freedom. That is our belief, and we intend to defend it. President Ma ying administration is totally disregarding this existential threat of, to our way of life. And we have received broad support in society. Since our occupation of legislature, Several polls by international media outlets have shown that over 70% of the Taiwanese population supported the Sunflower Movement occupation of legislature and demanded the government to respond according to our democratic and modest demands. President Ma ying is trying to imply that we are against free trade and against opening up. This is clearly false. Our objection against the our objection against the service trade agreement are based on, the clear, based on the clear fact that China is a large and undemocratic neighborhood that wants to absorb Taiwan. Like the people of Ukraine, we don't want to be pushed into the arm of an authoritarian neighbor. We are in favor of trade agreements that are arrived at freely, democratically, and with transparency. Taiwan people, Taiwanese people is not against trade deal negotiation. What we insist are the transparency of the trade negotiation, the due process of the legislation and the deliberation, the comprehensive impact assessment and the consideration and the inclusion of the opinion of the minorities, the laborers, and the young generation. This, is, this principle should be applied to all the trade negotiation, such as cross-trade service trade agreement, TPP or RCEP. President Ma ying has been trying to say that only if Taiwan signs this agreement with China, it will be possible to enter into other agreements like TPP. This is simply not true. Taiwan needs diversity and is already too economically dependent on China. So if this service trade agreement would only increase the Taiwanese economic reliance on, Ta on China, how is it going to help Taiwan open to the world? Taiwanese people want a trade agreement that is in conformity with the principle of democracy, procedural transparency, state sovereignty and indignity, economic justice and economic diversity. The Taiwan Relations Act of 1979 has allowed the U.S. to lend its support to Taiwan in a way no other country can. It is also through this continuous support of the U.S. for Taiwan's democracy that we, the young Taiwanese, can enjoy and lead our democ democratic and freedom. 
For that, we truly appreciate your strong and unswerving friendship. We, as the Sunflower Movement student activists, ask you to urge the U.S. Department of the State and the White House to express their deep concern to the Taiwan authorities about the gradual drift of a democratic Taiwan toward a repressive and authoritarian China. This draft is eroding the freedom and the democracy that we treasure so much. We do have this shared value with the United States, and we hope that the United States can stand with us to help protect our democracy. Thank you. As a matter of fact, the AIP, the American Institute in Taiwan, released a statement, uh, spoke first and said this morning that uh, Taiwan's membership in the TPP is not conditioned on passing the uh, service and trade agreement. So that is really false, that's a falsehood. Uh, Mr. Wei Yang's speech is available outside if you don't have it yet, and uh, you know, I urge you to take a copy with you. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce Meredith Wang. Can you get up, Meredith? And uh, she is the former spokesperson of the Sunflower Movement, so she doesn't have to say anything, but just wave to the crowd. <laughs> Uh, yes, a uh, couple of questions for Mr. Wei Young, if, you, if there's anybody also from the press, a uh, couple of questions in English. Let me be the first one. Uh, what is your program? Can you talk in microphone? Okay. What's your program in D.C. so far, Wei Young, and okay. what are your plans for the rest of the day? Okay, we, uh, we have visited, uh, uh, <laughs> yesterday we visited uh, George Washington University and we uh, have a speech with the, uh, to the Taiwanese student there, and there are some American students there too. We talk about the issues that happen in Taiwan, and they are really interesting, and uh, um, about the student movement. And uh, we also visit uh, some organizations uh, which have, uh, have been concerning Taiwan or China's issues for a long time. And uh, today, the, the briefing in the Congress, and later we, um, I, I know, uh, I, I, I can't remember all the schedule, but we will talk to a lot of Taiwanese uh, here in America, and uh, uh, maybe more tomorrow we will go to New York, and uh, uh, there will be a speech in uh, in a in a campus. Right. Uh, I don't know. I, I can't remember which school now. <laughs> yes. Right. And the response so far is very well. Oh well, they are very supportive. They all think this is a, a tremendous moment uh, for Taiwan's democracy, especially those students uh, from Taiwan. They they, all, they are very anxious, say, oh, what can we do in America, and, and trying to be supportive. And this is a very, this is, actually this is a very, uh, the major supporting force that, uh, uh, that we, we can sustain and we uh, urge us to go on, you know, to uh, achieve our goals, achieve our, uh, our demands. Right. Yes. Very good. Yes, Nadia. Hi, we are, uh, I'm Nadia Chao with the Liberty Times, Washington Correspondent. Uh, first of all, one piece of information I would like to add to what you just said, because as I know, the government, uh, executive branch, has briefed the LOI, uh, Legislative Union, before the service agreement three times. Yes. So, you know, when you talk about transparency, I think maybe the student also have to pay attention to the legislature, you know, what they're doing in the LY and when they receive those briefings, you know, who really, you know, um, had a great input or who ignored their responsibility. But I think when the movement is reflect the people's desire for responsible politician during the whole process and also maybe some of the defects of our institution. So, you know, rather just focusing on the executive branch alone, maybe the student movement should pay more uh, attention to other parts. To answer your question, yes, there were uh, three briefings uh, in the legislative UN last year, but uh, as far as I know, the first one is held uh, by May or April, I think it's May. Yeah, but uh, the, the agreement is signed in June, so it's a very short of time that the legislators can know, get to know about these issues and uh, to uh, counsel with their uh, 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 other industries or something. So I, I think the problem is the legislative UN, the legislative UN uh, have no have no have no rights to monitor or supervise because we don't have a law 
uh, to uh, allow the, the legislative later UN to do that. Not like America, uh, in America, the Congress can can supervise, can monitor the the whole trade negotiation, and they have a right to say, well, if if this is against our people's benefit, then. The, you have to start over negotiation or, or, or call, it, call, it to, call it to an end. But in Taiwan, we don't have this kind of law. So um, this time, of course, this is what the legislative branch have to do, that is to pass a monitoring law that it can um, uh, uh, to achieve the, the, our, our demand about the transparency and the due process. So yeah, that's, that's what we have to monitor the legislator or legislative branch. But uh, in the whole controversy, the string str str rolling of the uh, executive UN is very obvious. The, uh, the, the executive UN just throw the agreement to the to legis le legislative branch and say, you have to pass this in 30 days, otherwise you will automatically become valid. Well, this is just, well, I, th I think in, in a, in a democracy where the check and balance, balance system is important, this is just out of balance. So the executive UN have too much power. So this is why uh, a lot of students or student uh, movement, they, they point to the executive UN and say, well, you, you cannot do that anymore. You have to respect the legislative UN and the, you have to respect the, the legislator representative, the, the people's will. I don't know if I answer okay. Thank you, we are Tina. Yeah, I'll catch up with the Voice of America. So while you're in uh, Washington, do you have any chance or are you going to communicate with uh, Obama administration officials? I, I, oh, I think, yes, yeah, uh, State, State of Department. Uh, administration, not just Congress, yeah. Well, it's already being yeah, done. And what is the response you get? Um, no, we'll meet this afternoon. Oh. Yeah. 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 Could you tell us what, um, <coughs> What, how confident are you that the student proposed version of the monetary law will get a fair hearing in the legislative end as opposed to the KMT's version um, of the law? Okay. And how much confidence do you have that one thing can, can follow through on its promises? Yes, yes. This is a very uh, crucial question whether or not uh, Wang will keep his promise. You know, uh, no negotiation before. Uh, the, the monitoring law is passed. Of course, we have to bear the the uh, price that he he did not keep his prom he didn't keep his promise. But if he keep his promise, then I think the the uh, the all all the organizations, NGO, student will watch the the process of of the legislature legislative process. For example, whether or not they will pass the executive UN's version. Or, how, or if they are going to combine the two versions, then what's the percentage of the, the, our, our students' version? You, you were, I don't did that. You mean how much confident are we? I, I, just, I can just, we, we cannot tell, tell it right now. We have to keep going and uh, put pressure on the, on the government. Just the confident won't, do, won't, won't help. We just have to keep going and put pressure, yes. Yes. I'm uh, Tony Liao from Central News Agency, Taiwan. And a question about the media reports of the, the protester. And we saw their protest yesterday and two against several medias. So, what's your um, comment about it that, that in the past two weeks? And some media's report focus on, um, on protesters and being portrayed as the violence and uh, illegal actions. You mean the media in Taiwan, or well, well, I think the media in Taiwan um, didn't didn't portray us as that negative that that negative way because um, that's few of the medias that will demonize the student movement. Let's say we are the riot, we uh, destroy uh, the the building, and we cause damages. Uh, everybody have to pay the bill, but. But for, for example, yesterday, uh, two of the medias, uh, they accept uh, the, the, the movement, they have this commercial, this advertise, advertise wants to put on the newspaper. And the two of the newspapers uh, 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 help us to put, uh, to, uh, 
uh, accept our uh, advertise freely you know, without any, any charge. So you can see on the front page is the, the advertise for the student movement. So I think the media this time is uh, quite friendly compared to what they were back in, in a few years ago. And uh, the, the two years ago, there was a movement called anti-media monopoly, anti-media anti monopoly. I think that kind of helped the, the reform of Taiwan media. So, well, I don't know if this answer your question. Are you going to keep paying attention to several media you guys used to protest before in the coming days, uh, coming years, whatever? Uh, I, I, sorry, I didn't. So in Chinese, you see the TV? Yes, in Chinese. I don't want to. I don't want to uh, just focus on several media, but uh, students protest against a few media many times. Uh, so your question is, will you continue to protest the media like you did a few days ago with CTI TV? Is that your question? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I understand. Okay, I want to be uh, clear that uh, I don't think, as, as far as I'm concerned, that we are not against specific media, media but, but to, to, re, to view their, their content of, of report, if they are mis, misreporting or something, of course we have, to, we have to do something, we have to um, correct it, or if they don't respond friendly, well, for like yesterday or the day before yesterday, there were a crowd gathering uh, in front of the one of the media building and protesting, saying, "Well, you should do your news or you should do your report rightly." So, well, I think we don't we 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 don't mean to um, demonize certain or specific media, but just the way Taiwanese media or Taiwanese reporter are doing their news is just, isn't just right. So, well, I think. I think not just one, that's a common, that's a general, uh, general phenomenon in Taiwan media. So, well, we are we're aware of that. All right, so I think that's about it. I have a final question for Wei Yang, and I would first let me thank you for uh, coming over, and for, you know, the, especially the Board Affairs aides who uh, stayed for a long time. You know. and, and so, I think there's still some food. We can chat a little bit if you feel free to stay here long, especially with congratulations. And my final question is, can I take a photo with Wei Young America? <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much for the speaker, Joe Bunch Talk, and Wei Young.